phylogenies. So we've up till now talked about how do you name things? That's taxonomy. You put them into one in, into those different um, groups, those different taxons, and you get a name to it, taxonomy. Looking at systematics, we're going to see how they're related to each other. You can use the um, the structures of an organism. You can use their morphology. You can use their molecular characteristics to create a tree. Um, here we've got cnidarians, platyomenthes, nematodes, mollusks, annelids, arthropods, echinoderms, and chordates. Things with backbones. Now, what I want to ask you guys to do, for just take, take like five minutes, I want you to figure out how they're related to each other. That is, group them together that are closest. Um, for instance, which of these look to be the closest together? Which of these look to be the most closely related? How about this? You've had better issue. Which is the least related to all the rest? Spider? spider is nothing like any of the rest of them, right? We good on that? So we're going to put a spider all by itself over in the corner. It is what we call a root. We're going to compare all the rest of them to a spider. So why are all the rest different from spiders? They have no legs. So we're going to say right here, I'm going to say no legs. Now, which one's the next different? Frog. Wait, frogs have legs? That's crazy. Yeah. All right, so frogs must come next then, right? Because the frogs have legs. How are frogs and... Sp okay, sure. Uh, no exoskeleton. <laughs> then, no legs after the frog. Then, then what's the next one that comes, do you think? The next most different. Well, does the starfish have legs? I don't know. It's your call. You're the scientist. <laughs> what does? Oh, the starfish. Oh, so maybe the starfish is the one that's most different from the rest. Okay. We can, we can start over. Starfish over here. All right. Then what's the next one? Oh, you want to starfish here? Starfish. Oh, because it has no face. Then we say here, no face. All right, and we keep going, and we keep adding and adding and adding. Is that the only possible way these things are related to each other? No, not at all. You could look at, you, could, you, you the scientist, have to figure these out. Right now, we're just using morphology. And using just morphology can lead to lots and lots of variation, depending on what you place as the most um, important form. Here's how there's been a consensus that they come out, with the Nidarians over here, the jellyfish being the most basal, then the Platyalmenthes, then the nematodes. Then we get a big split, because these are all animals, of mollusks, annelids, and arthropods, and then echinoderms and chordates are close together. I wouldn't have put econoderms in the starfish over here with chordates, but it turns out, molecularly, they're super alike. Like, it's because we're called what are termed deuterostomes. Um, we have both, we have uh, basically a mouth and, a, wait, deuterostomes, their anus forms first versus their mouth. Remember that these trees that we create are a, a hypothesis. They're our best explanation for how these organisms are related to each other. You can have data that supports it or refutes it, but you cannot prove these because you can't go back in time and watch the whole thing happen. So when you make these trees, and you will make these trees, I will 100% have you make these trees um, on your assessment, in your lab you're going to work on them. What I care about is your reasoning, not whether you're right or wrong. So we're going to create phylogenetic trees to express the relationships between um, the different organisms. Here's how you read a tree. Usually, on one axis, you're going to have time. And on one axis, you're going to have genetic differences. In this case, 
8 million years ago, we had a forest ape. Over time, that forest ape split into different groups. The chimpanzee group, the homo group, and the gorilla group. In fact, chimpanzee and gorilla and homo split about 6 million years ago. When did um, the chimpanzee, western chimpanzee, and bonobo split from each other? About 3 million years ago. When did, oh, so what's happening over here? You see all these lines that just stop. What occurs there? Why did they just stop? That's where they go extinct. You'll notice that in most times, there's not terribly many homo forms around. Um, Neanderthal was the last group that existed simultaneous with modern humans. Um, the gorillas, they, you know, they just recently split, about the same time we split from Homo erectus. So you're just reading the chart. Any questions on how to read the table? Okay. When you're looking at these charts, you're going to see two distinct things happening. You're going to have anagenesis and cladogenesis. Anagenesis is where, over time, one species becomes another. Cladogenesis is where one species splits into two or more species. You're forming new clades. We talked about that already. So when you're looking at that chart of um, how, when and how long humans evolved, you'll notice that there are long branches of anagenesis and small times where cladogenesis occurs. At the base of each branch is a node. That's sort of like the, the connection point of, um, this is not talking about plants, each branch in your phylogenetic tree. Wherever you have that node, wherever you have that split, that's where cladogenesis occurred. All the rest is anagenesis. And we're splitting them into what are called clades. Clades are just groups. This is a clade. This is a clade. The whole freaking thing is a clade. They're groups, clusters, and they can be described in several ways. So modern taxonomy, we're naming things and we're undergoing systematics, is trying to sort organisms based on their evolutionary relationships. We're not just trying to split them based on how they currently look, we're trying to figure out, in the past, how are they related to each other. So there are three big, broad types of, um, of clades. Monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic. What does mono mean? One, single. Uh, poly? Many. Do you guys know what para means? Close. It means almost, but not quite. Like, a paralegal is almost, but not quite a lawyer. Not, see, literally, that's what, it's, what it means. So a monophyletic group includes the common ancestor and all of its offspring and all of its descendants. This is a monophyletic group. This, a monophyletic group. This whole thing, monophyletic. The common ancestor and every one of its descendants. A little trickier when you talk about the paraphyletic group. A paraphyletic group is a common ancestor and almost all but not all of the descendants. Some of, are, some of them are left out. Think of it as um, if you guys, your family's anything like my family. I have those cousins that I'm like, yeah, they, they're not related to me. You know what I'm talking about? Like, we all have that, that, that terrible uncle that you don't want to spend Thanksgiving with. Um, that would be the one that you exclude from the phylogeny. They're out of the family. That would be a paraphylogeny. Everybody except that one. Make sense? Polyphylogeny is just the opposite. It's got all of the, the common ancestor and all the descendants plus an outside. You're including an outsider. Um, did any of you guys have like that person in, in, that you consider to be part of your family that is not blood related to you? Yeah, that would be a polyphylogeny. Your family plus an extra. 
So you have monophylogenies, which is what you're shooting for, paraphylogenies, when you can't include all the offspring for some reason, all the descendants, and um, polyphyletic, where you include extra descendants from a common ancestor. Wow.